On the 8th of May, the day after Hitler had committed suicide in a bunker in Berlin, Prime Minister Churchill stood on a balcony of Buckingham Palace and addressed a cheering crowd declaring, This is your victory. The crowd roared back, No, it is yours. Less than three months later, he was out of a job. World War II had changed many people's view on what the role of government was, and whilst Churchill had been the right man to lead through war, he was not seen as the right man to lead us into peace. Post-war Britain experienced changes in the country on a scale never seen before. Keeping to his manifesto promises, the newly elected Prime Minister Attlee nationalised important industries like the rail network and pension scheme, and most famously created the National Health Service. Attlee only lasted one term in office, but the Conservatives who had been against his reforms recognised their popularity and kept the majority of them. The war had cost Britain its great power status, but recognising this fact was hard for many to accept. In 1945, Britain was still the third largest economy in the world, but that position was set to drop over the coming years as faster growing economies, including recent enemies Germany and Japan, soon outpaced British production. That loss of power was showcased for the world to see in the 1956 Suez Crisis. Britain, along with France and Israel, intervened in Egypt to prevent losing control over the highly profitable Suez Canal. American President Eisenhower promptly ordered their withdrawal, and a Britain dependent on American loans gave in. When Britain developed their own nuclear weapons in 1952, those warheads still had to be put on American missiles as the British couldn't afford to build their own. Additionally, the empire, once the main source of Britain's great power status, was becoming a burden to it. Administrating colonies was costing more than the money they made, and the idea of empires after a world war against them was no longer a popular idea. The first countries to leave were India and Pakistan in 1947. Nationalist rebellions in places like Malaysia and Kenya drained Britain's fragile economy. Britain couldn't afford to keep subduing such rebellions, and so in 1960, Prime Minister Macmillan announced a change in policy. The Wind of Change speech accepted and accelerated the decolonisation process. On the whole, good relations were maintained between the motherland and her former colonies, and a remarkable entity, due as much to its ill-defined purpose as its surprising success, was the creation of the Commonwealth, which allowed Britain an influence in world affairs it might not otherwise be able to hold. But it wasn't only Britain that had an impact on her colonies. Those colonies began to have an impact on Britain, and in a far closer capacity than many expected. In 1948, there were plenty of jobs in Britain, but not enough workers to fill them. The British National Nationalities Act granted all peoples of the empire the right to British citizenship so as to encourage workers to come to Britain. It had been assumed that only white people from old Commonwealth countries like Canada and Australia would want or could afford to come, but transport companies saw an opportunity to make money by offering reduced rates. The first to do this was the SS Empire Windrush, sailing from the Caribbean. The transformation wasn't immediate, but by 1965 about a quarter of a million Caribbean immigrants worked in Britain and money being sent home by workers to Jamaica was that island's second largest source of income. During the war, African-American GIs had been welcomed by many communities in Britain, but in peacetime, underlying attitudes of racial superiority and suspicion of foreigners re-emerged. This colour bar prevented Caribbean immigrants from securing good housing, jobs or enjoying their leisure time. Most of these immigrants were young single men with wages to spend. As a result, some set up their own drinking clubs. These grew in reputation as places of loud music and unruly behaviour and added to tensions in affected communities like Brixton. In 1958, several racially aggravated attacks by gangs of white youths led to rioting in Notting Hill. Stricter rules on immigration followed, but there was also a recognition that something needed to be done to tackle racism. One such attempt was the establishment of the Notting Hill Carnival. In 1957, Prime Minister Macmillan claimed that the British people had never had it so good, and in some respects he was right. The economy, whilst not rising as fast as some other nations, was on the up. There was full employment, people had more disposable income than ever before, and more consumer goods to spend it on. By 1963, 80% of households had television sets, compared to only 20% 10 years before. In 1955, Britain's first commercial TV channel, ITV, was launched to compete with BBC One. Advertising became a larger part of life and more closely targeted specific groups, in particular the youth. 
The 20th century was the first time in human history large numbers of adolescents had money of their own and a vast array of ways in which to spend it. The teenager was born, and these teenagers were the baby boom generation. There had been a notable spike in births when the war had ended. These were children who had grown up not experiencing war, but faced with parents who had, and many observed a divide between them. It wasn't just parental figures, but all people in position of authority. The urge to rebel against the man was widespread. Many young people attempted to differentiate themselves from older generations through the clothes they wore. Gangs like the Teddy Boys and later the Mods and the Rockers caused panic in the media that a generation of young people were getting out of control. But it wasn't just teenagers who were demanding change. From 1964, a Labour government was back in power, the first since Attlee's, and Prime Minister Wilson was keen for change. Wilson himself was the first ever Prime Minister to have a state school education, not a private fee-paying one. He spoke of the need for a new Britain to be forged from the white heat of technological change. New universities were set up, laws against discrimination based on race and gender were enacted, homosexuality was decriminalised, the death penalty abolished, abortion legalised and the contraceptive pill became available to the general public. The 1960s was a time of cultural explosion for British creatives. Various forms of arts and literature pushed the envelope on taboo subjects, such as the novels A Clockwork Orange and Lady Chatterley's Lover. The popularity of bands such as The Beatles and The Rolling Stones spread British culture overseas. What became known as the British Invasion spread to include influences from fashion like Mary Quant's miniskirt to film like the James Bond franchise. And at home, movements like the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, environmentalism and pacifism all gained huge support. Popular protests in the UK were undoubtedly influenced by the civil rights movement in America. Every evening, those events were beamed into people's houses on television news. They encouraged similar marches in Northern Ireland, where the divisions between communities that had their origins in religious differences spilled over into issues regarding housing, jobs and local government. By the early 1970s, these protests had descended into violence, especially due to the heavy-handedness of the police and later army. In January 1972, 14 unarmed protesters were killed by British soldiers in an event dubbed Bloody Sunday. It kicked off a period of civil unrest in the province that lasted over 30 years and claimed thousands of lives, the Troubles. It also massively boosted paramilitary membership, in particular the IRA, whose campaign for violence led to terrorist attacks in Britain. The 70s also saw South Asian migration overtake Caribbean ones. This included a large influx of Indian communities that were forcibly removed from Kenya and Idi Amin's Uganda in a surge of Africa First movements. This was a time when Britain's role in the world was being questioned. By 1971, Britain had withdrawn all its military forces east of the Suez due to costs. The special relationship with the United States that had flourished in World War II had been wilting away since the Suez Crisis. It was further weakened by America not consulting Britain during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis and later on, Macmillan's refusal to involve British troops in Vietnam. In 1945, Britain's major trading partners had been its colonies, but by 1971 it was clear Britain was economically tied to Europe. Attempts to join the European Common Market had been blocked on two occasions owing to French President de Gaulle's distrust of Britain. But by 1971, he was out of office and Britain was accepted in. To American scholars, the European Common Market, which became the EU in 1994, was there as a safeguard against future US involvement in what they viewed to be the centuries-old European Civil War. But to some in Britain, closer ties to Europe was another attempt, like Hitler and Napoleon before them, to make Britain submit to foreign rule. This issue would not go away. But the economic problems were too great to not seek closer ties. The number of days lost in industrial action was increasing. Unemployment hit 1 million in 1976, the first time since the Great Depression of the 1930s. In 1974, energy reserves were in such short supply, a temporary three-day working week was imposed. The 70s also saw the advent of stagflation, as the economy suffered the unpleasant combination of both rising prices and a stagnant economy. The final months of 1978 into early 1979 became known as the winter of discontent, as a large public sector strike saw bin men refusing to work. Whilst economically these strikes were not the most damaging of recent years, the psychological impact of seeing mountains of rubbish in places like Leicester Square led to outrage from the general population. In the decades following World War II, both main political parties had had a broadly similar set of priorities in governing the country. But by the end of the 1970s, this post-war consensus had broken down. The economy was doing very poorly, and so was Britain standing as a great power. Britain had changed a great deal in a short amount of time. It would continue to radically change even further in the decades to come.
This period begins with the end of the Second World War in 1945 and a new Labour government in power. Three years later the NHS was created and the British Nationalities Act allowed people from the colonies to become British citizens. Britain experienced huge challenges over the following decades as it struggled with decolonisation, large-scale immigration, the women's rights movements and youth dissonance, all while the British economy continued to perform less well than its competitors. By the end of the 1970s, the solution to this decline offered by both main parties were at odds with one another. 